Hello and welcome back to On Chain Reaction. I'm your host, James Bennett, and today we're going to be taking a look at what's going on on the Bitcoin network as well as in the institutional fund flows world. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So to begin with, uh, it's worth noting that volatility of Bitcoin has been increasing sharply over the last six weeks, as I'm sure you have all well noticed. Bitcoin currently sits at about $45,000 with volatility back up above 80%, something that we only saw uh, in the sort of early earlier parts of last year and also January, February of this year. Um, of course, we did see a very sharp decline in volatility to more reasonable 50% levels uh, while Bitcoin was in that sort of 55 to 60K bracket. But now we've broken down, it's really picked up uh, a lot of volatility. Okay, uh, so, you know, looking at one of my favorite metrics, which is Bitcoin's price to sales ratio, it's called the network value to transaction ratio. So it looks at the total amount of uh, value that the network holds. That's the active supply times by uh, the dollar price. Many of you know it as market cap, but it's slightly different in that it's taking the, the active coins. Um, and then you're looking at the total transaction value that's going over the market relative to that. So if price is the network value, sales are the transactions, uh, total sum dollar of transactions going over the network. And just like a price to E, you know, uh, sorry, a price to earnings, a PE ratio in traditional equities, uh, we can see points where Bitcoin's uh, price, its network value is relatively high compared to the amount of uh, dollar value that it's settling over the network. So here in grey, we're looking at the NVT on a five week, so just over a month period. Um, and uh, and then the, the darker line there is price. The dotted line I've put across is just a reference point uh, to show you when we're seeing these peaky moments uh, for the five week NVT. You can see that it happened uh, sort of mid uh, of last year, August, September last year, just before the last sort of major price correction that happened before the run up all the way up to 60,000. Uh, but from January through until today, we've been consistently running on a much higher uh, price to sales ratio for Bitcoin. And you can see each time uh, that NVT peaks, uh, we're, uh, there's a subsequent sort of downtrend. So the good news is we've moved out of that high uh, NVT uh, period at the moment. And um, you can see we're back down on the far right about 12. Uh, that's a multiple of 12. Uh, but you know, ultimately, uh, that period between Jan and, and April, although it was great to see Bitcoin's price at that level, uh, it wasn't necessarily sustained by the amount of activity happening on the chain. Okay, so for the rest of the presentation, I've got four, five, five slides here, um, and we're going to be looking all at the um, the sort of uh, institutional flow side for Bitcoin. It's a massive part of the pricing equation, and hopefully, you'll see why uh, shortly after this video. So, okay, we're beginning with the miners side. Um, new Bitcoin, if, if someone wants to buy new, new, new Bitcoin, there's only two places at a high level where they can get them. Well, one is from the market of existing Bitcoin, uh, let's call them the hodlers. And then the other side is the miners who are obviously getting new Bitcoin uh, every time they mine a block. That's 6.25 Bitcoin uh, every uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, but it used to be uh, 12 and a half Bitcoin up until the halving, which was in May of 2020. Okay, so looking more closely at this chart, what we can see is that uh, that left sort of period, um, maybe the first quarter I've highlighted there, we're seeing uh, about 54,000 Bitcoin per month uh, that miners are generating. Uh, and then after the halving, that number's half. So it's 27,000 new Bitcoin coming into the market every month. Now, we've got uh, the price here in gold. The blue line is the miners rolling inventory. I think many of you will be familiar by now if you've seen me talking about this before. Um, but when we see over 100%, it means that more Bitcoin are being sent by miners into the market for the first time than they are being generated. So say a miner uh, generates 54,000 Bitcoin in a month they would need to send out 54,000 Bitcoin in a month in order to be 100%. So that's a one for one. Everything they've generated or been awarded, uh, they introduce into the market. Now, when we see that number above 100%, it means there's more than, in this case, 54,000 Bitcoin being sent out. And less means they are hoarding Bitcoin, putting them in their inventory and selling them at a later date. 
So why this is important? Well, because ultimately what we're saying is that through the latter parts of last year and into this year, we can see that that MRI number has been consistently above 100% which means miners have taken inventory that they've been storing in the past and they've been selling it into the market as the price has been gaining strength. So whilst that's very much true um, in Q4 of last year, you can see the beginning of this year as well, we spiked at 165%, so 1.65 times the amount of Bitcoin that they created, they've actually introduced into the market. Now they're starting to sort of deplete that rate of inventory um, and uh, and you can see now we're at about 103%. So they are still selling more than they mined, but at a slower rate, right? So two things I want you to take away. One, we've gone from 54,000 Bitcoin last year to 27,000 uh, Bitcoin per month this year. So the actual total amount that they're introducing is reduced. And two, the MRI, which is the rate that new coins are coming into the market from those uh, miners is also declining. So fewer Bitcoin in the last few months actually coming into uh, circulation. So, okay, as we, we said, there's two places that you can get uh, Bitcoin if you're an investor. One is from the market and the other is from the miners. Um, and so that's the sort of supply side of the equation, if you like. Here now we're starting to look at the combination of demand and supply. Um, and so uh, this chart here shows the uh, total inflows into uh, institutional funds or products. So that's your ETFs in Canada, your closed end front, uh, funds in the US, and then your exchange traded products across, across Europe. Um, right, there's a lot going on here, so I'll just walk you through it. Uh, in blue, you've got the Bitcoin price, it should be quite familiar by now. Uh, and then in orange, you're looking at the 30 day rolling inflows of total funds in less the new um, uh, inventory that's been released by miners, so we call it minor sales. You can see this live over at Bytree Asset Management. Um, the dotted line, the dark grey dotted line going horizontally across the chart is when we're at zero, so there's net zero um, new uh, inflows relative to, to new coins being sold and vice versa. So typically what we're seeing here is when the orange line, uh, which is total amount of new funds coming in, less what's being sold is growing, then we're seeing, uh, as in above zero, then we're seeing demand is greater than supply new issuance. And you can see there that you know that was really a huge driver of that uh, price action from May, but particularly in Q4, where we were seeing about 40 to 60,000 more Bitcoin being demanded by institutions than what was being released into the market by miners. What's happened so far this year? Well, so far this year, actually, the reverse has been true. So on the one hand, we've seen declining inflows um, from institutions, and I'll show you that uh, shortly. But on the other hand, we've actually seen, as I showed you on the previous one, MRI is dropping. So fewer coins are being sold. But still, despite the fact that it's going at a declining rate, there are still more coins coming in than there are being generated. Remember, we're at 103% at the moment. Um, so yeah, and that's you know a big part of what underpinned that move up to sixty thousand is now slightly lagging. Uh, so we are looking more towards the secondary market activity in order to sustain the price, uh, because this primary market, as we call it, um, from the new issuance and, and fund flows, uh, is has been sort of dropping off through the year. Okay, so a big piece of that uh, inflow that we saw between well, Q4, let's say 21, uh, was Grayscale Investment Trust. So Grayscale at one point, I think, reached about $50 billion in uh, Bitcoin, um, and they had you know, close to, here you can see, about 600,000 Bitcoin, uh, which is a huge percentage of the active supply. Now, since um, the beginning of this year, we've seen that actually Grayscale halted new inflows into their uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, the GBTC, um, and haven't been you know, issuing any new uh, units for that. And that's predominantly the, the main sort of uh, slowdown of new flows coming in. Okay, um, so why have they started, uh, why have they stopped accepting new uh, unit issuance? Well, a big part of it is because the, 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 um, the, the, the product is now trading at a severe discount uh, to its net asset value. 
So essentially what's happened is that this Grayscale Investment Trust vehicle is a closed-end fund. It's basically a one-way ticket into investing in Bitcoin in the primary market. So you're a high net worth, you need to have over a million dollars, I believe, in investable assets in order to actually participate in issuing new shares. Now, if you do pass that test, that's great. And you can um, have your own Bitcoin shares. You have to hold them for six months. And then after that, you can sell them on the secondary market and they can then be purchased on the secondary market by um, the sort of uh, tax advantage savings uh, vehicles in the US. And that's why they were so popular. So what funds were doing, um, well, I should say that the reason, um, because they were so popular and because it was actually very difficult to acquire uh, Bitcoin exposure in a tax efficient way um, in the US, that drove an excess demand for this particular product, which meant that if the Bitcoin were worth, let's say, $40 billion, actually the market, the secondary market was willing to pay, you know, we see up to a, a 20, 30% premium. Um, so pay over and above uh, that amount in order to get exposure to those Bitcoin. So each Bitcoin was worth 30% more to them. Now, what's happened over the last sort of three or four months is that there's been a lessening uh, appetite for that instrument. Uh, I think partly because there's other instruments coming onto the market uh, and the fees, you know, are, are obviously at a pain point, I think at around two and a half percent. Uh, it's not cheap to get exposure to Bitcoin. And what's happened is because that market's dried up or drying up relatively, uh, we've gone from a 30% premium um, at, in the beginning of this year down to on the right hand side, you can see a negative 18% discount. So regardless of the price of Bitcoin, if you were just holding the GBTC between the beginning of January and today, you would have lost 50% um, of that value uh, through this, this product, even though you know, regardless of what Bitcoin itself has, has done. Um, so, uh, by the way, this is all on Bytree Asset Management as well, I should say. So if you want to look at it daily live and see how the GBTC discount is performing, you can. Okay, the last slide is really just to kind of help tie the picture together for you. Um, so this is a, a fantastic uh, bit of data that I've taken from the block and it's come from the CFTC COT. Um, and, you know, what has happened is that um, because there was that premium that we just saw on the last slide um, and it was only accessible to institutional investors or people with over a million dollars in investable assets, then there was, you know, essentially an arbitrage trade available for these institutions that would come in, buy uh, Bitcoin at cost, um, issue new shares against it, and then six months later be able to sell it at a 30% premium. Um, and so what they did is, regardless of whether they were interested in the long-term exposure to uh, Bitcoin, the asset, there was a trade there where they could collect this 30% premium um, as an arbitrage. Uh, but because, you know, necessarily they didn't want to have the uh, Bitcoin exposure to the price, uh, they would cover their positions by shorting uh, Bitcoin in the, um, in the futures market. Uh, and this wonderful data source here, you can see from January 2020 until kind of April or March 21, and um, there was a very clear net um, short position for hedge funds in particular uh, of about 1.8 billion, uh, negative 1.8 billion, which you know is a part of the uh, the arbitrage that was going on the grayscale premium. And you can see bottom right hand side, hedge funds close their GBTC arbitrage. Now, you don't want to be uh, trying to run that trade because, well, you're down at a 20% uh, negative to net asset value. So it's, it's not a great place to be. The last thing I want to point out here is that if we look at the other um, sectors within the market, and this is a very small segment, so I wouldn't take too much away from it, but it is interesting uh, to see the, the asset managers other and non-reported segments um, seeing that sort of shift in sentiment. So they were long uh, Bitcoin up until a few weeks ago and has recently, you can see all three of those lined on the far right hand side now trending back down towards shorts. So sentiment's shifting, there's a lot of fear in the market. Fundamentals are still looking pretty good and Bitcoin at $45,000 is certainly one to take seriously. Um, that's all from me for now. If you have any questions, as always, you can reach out to us at info at bytree.com or I'm on Twitter at James on the chain. Okay, bye now.